My name is Nancy Stanlick. I'm the uh, one of the associate deans in the College of Arts and Humanities and the associate dean for research. And I wanted to thank everybody for joining and participating in this first session of the College of Arts and Humanities seminar series. We've carefully thought through and consulted with our presenters regarding the value and impact of the seminars. And with them, we wish to provide research and teaching in the arts and humanities in, a, in, an entertaining, in an entertaining and informative format. We're hopeful that the topics and, and the subject areas and teaching and research in the academic and creative areas being presented will pique your interest and increase your particip participation in our work. Invite your friends to come to the virtual seminars, both this one and the one and the ones coming up. We have four more after this one so far, and we plan to have more into the future. They range from Judaic studies, which is today's topic, to intercultural communication and language acquisition with Ala Karova from Modern Languages and Literatures, to the work of our Center for Humanities and Digital Research. I see that Bruce Jans, who is its director, is here. UCF's new Center for Ethics, which is uh, directed by Jonathan Beaver. Create at the downtown campus, which is directed by Stella Sung and beyond. The summer series revolves around issues of intercultural communication and cooperation through quality information. And many of our presentations touch on issues of social justice. Today's talk via Zoom will be structured as follows. First, the presentation will be about 30 minutes We'll hold 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions. Attendees, videos, and microphones are set to off, and we ask that you respect that throughout the talk. Disruptions can't be tolerated because it would interfere with the presenter's information and would cause immediately re immediate removal from the event. If you have any questions or comments, please type those for the speaker in the chat box, and the moderator will ask your questions at the end of the presentation, and I'm the moderator. Today's presentation will be posted on the college's YouTube account and shared at ka.ucf.edu slash seminars. Thank you all for joining us for today's presentation and I'll now turn it over to Ken Hansen, who is the presenter for today on issues regarding Judaic studies and his videos and programs regarding that particular element of his academic area. So there you go. Well, thank you, Nancy. Welcome to all of you who are dropping in this afternoon via Zoom. As you heard, I'm Ken Hansen, and today I want to share a Zoom conversation of my own that I had with my video editor, Milos Ajdanovic, originally from Serbia and who now teaches at UCF, who has uh, supplied really all of the brilliant editing that's gone into my own educational videos. So this is basically what we're calling an editor's cut where I'm sharing several of our video productions and talking with Milos about the whole creative process. It's about half an hour long, will not bore you, and I wanna run it and then feel some questions. So let us charge into it. I'm Ken Hansen. I'm the coordinator of the UCF Judaic Studies program. I've been teaching at UCF for quite a few years now and find myself in the very happy position of being able now to direct the whole Judaic Studies program as part of the history program. Now, some years ago, actually it was 19, no, it was 2015, that it was put to me that students really these days want to take more and more online courses. It was, presented to me that I needed to go through the IDL course, learn how to teach online so that we can appeal to more of our undergraduate students who take our programs, who might have conflicts with other classes, other courses, and might otherwise not enroll for a Judaic studies course. I thought at the time, this could well be, for me, a career killer. Uh, after all, why did I get into teaching? because I like to sit behind a computer terminal? No, I like to stand in front of real live students, flesh and blood and stand up and talk and interact and use the board and show them my own images on the screen that I've created and create a whole world in the classroom. I can't do that anymore. 
because our enrollments are going down, because students want online courses. I said, no, no, no. I went through the IDL program in any case to learn how to teach online. And part of it involved showing the attendees the amazing CDL television facility. It's incredible. Now, I happen to have a bit of a background in television before I got into academe. I did a master's degree in television and international intercultural communication. I actually worked for a time in a war zone in Lebanon during the uh, Lebanese war. So I was intrigued, to say the least, when I looked at that TV studio. Uh, amazing uh, green screen. Actually, it's a green wall and cameras with teleprompter. And I thought to myself, hmm, maybe I could do something that is really unique, that is really special. Perhaps it hasn't been fully done before, which is to record my lectures that I used to give in class, but now turn them into video episodes, a la History Channel. Well, I got with my instructional designer, I got with the videographers over at CDO, and I went in and started doing it. And came up with something that I thought, and still think is really unique. I remember to myself when I was an undergraduate student and a history major, wouldn't it be incredible if I had some of the lectures that my old professors used to give. I remember one professor in particular of American history, Professor Thornton, who used to stand at the, uh, in a lecture hall at the University of Illinois where I studied, stand in front of a packed lecture hall, and, and he would make an observation and he would end up saying, how extraordinary, how extraordinary. And I remember those words. I remember him talking about how a, a President uh, Jefferson used to walk back and forth in the middle of the night in the White House because he was so disturbed about uh, the Louisiana Purchase and could he, could he do it, did he have the authority to do it? What I would give to have those lectures, and I thought to myself, hmm, you know, we can create lectures that students could actually keep, review, study, even for tests and quizzes. My goodness, how many students basically tune out during a live lecture. This is a common experience, but I thought now online, we can actually quiz our students about our video lectures and the retention of what we say in class now on video is going to be way higher than it ever was before because students can stop their video. They can watch it again and again. And I've had students that tell me they do exactly this and the feedback I've gotten from my students is really heartening to say the least. So I'm going to show a little promo, a little video promo that uh, CDL put together to illustrate the process of creating online, online educational experiences. Here we go. As a young man, I went to Israel and I got the bug. Judaic studies is an amazing field within the humanities. Here we investigate the whole of at least Western civilization and thought and culture through the eyes of one particular people. Ken has been coming here for a couple of years, doing videos for the different courses within the Jewish Studies program. We have a product, it's knowledge. And as with any other product, you have to sell your consumer. And how do you do that? You create a memorable experience. <laughs> We want to develop a pilot episode for a course on biblical archaeology that can really turn into a whole series, as has never been done before. 
all the students that are coming in now, they're already used to that kind of information through YouTube, through Facebook. Anybody who's not presenting their material with at least some video in it, um, it is not keeping up with what the students want. We can develop a prototype for what can be done across the educational platform and to do it theatrically, to do it professionally and make this available not just for our students in the university but to the general public. That's an amazing goal and that's what we're after. We want to create long-term education and that comes from, hey, remembering what you studied. Okay. And I'm here today with my good friend and now colleague, Milos Aydinovich, who's been working with me from the beginning of this process. The thing about CDL is that while they have the most amazing studio, television studio, they have edit bays, they have an incredible staff, but to do the kind of work that I just displayed with that level of editing for our students, that was frankly more than CDL was able to manage. So uh, the College of Arts and Humanities, CA, did a wonderful service by finding Milos, who's here with me today. At the time, a graduate student in the film school, and he was able to take on this project with a bit of a stipend from CA, and just did yeoman's work. He really took what I produced in front of a green screen with a teleprompter and a script and turned it into really professional quality, almost History Channel quality video. How did you do that, Milos? How did you go about taking green screen? What do you have to do? I think I started working uh, on it in 2016. And, um, and I was a student. I was in my second year. Um, I was working, preparing my, um, my thesis project, which was a feature film. Um, and I was taking classes, so you can imagine I've had um, really, uh, you know, a, a lot of work ahead of me. And then, you know, you and I talked, and then and I, I agreed to start working on. I hired you immediately. <laughs> you you hired me, and and then you know, as you said, it's uh, it's basically you would send me um, raw material, you know, like your. Uh, performance uh, in front of a green screen and uh, the I think what we had arranged was that every Monday right you had every Monday morning uh, you had to upload a uh, basically an episode of of your course um, and then so for me it became what happened was I would I would take the weekend I would like do it over the weekend and um, so to tell you the truth, honest, honestly, if you ask me now, like, how did you do it? I really don't know because it's uh, kind of like a, it was a very, you know, fast paced, um, uh, process of, of, you know, taking out the green, you know, it's mostly technical stuff, but, but like technical stuff, but there's a lot to that. You had to replace the green screen with a whole host of images. And then you even added a musical background yeah, underneath, yeah, musical I head entire, underneath all of that. Yes, I, I, I would, I would uh, do what I would say, like the entire post-production on, uh, on the material that you provided and, and do it very quickly in a very kind of like a fast paced way to get to, you know, like get to that deadline on Monday. And it was, uh, it was a, an interesting experience. It was it was really really amazing. I, I will say it um, really um, you know it really helped me uh, get up to like a very nice level of working with different kinds of software and you know because there there was just no time you had to like really quickly make. So this was a really part of your professional development. Yeah, 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 definitely. At a practical level, absolutely. And I, I really enjoyed uh, uh, you being so open and, and uh, experimental uh, uh, about things, and you know. And then I, I experimental is, is a good word. I, <laughs> I happen to have a little bit of acting background as well, and I thought to myself, why not 
just because I'm in the academic world, does that mean that we take all of our experiences from before and just kind of chuck them because now we're academics? Uh, in the end, I also had a vision of wanting to share what we produce with the world out there. Uh, so even beyond placing all the video into Canvas, I created a YouTube channel called Treasures in Time. And anybody can go on to this YouTube channel now and literally watch what we produced for our students. I'm gonna see if I can share that. Here we go. Here's my YouTube channel, Treasures in Time. Look, we have over 2,000 subscribers and look at all the courses that Milos has edited. We have six courses all together. We won't even fit all on the same page. There's the, the Holocaust project, Ancient Israel. We have a course that we call it at UCF, we call the Jewish View of Jesus. On uh, YouTube, I call it Kosher Jesus. Uh, the most recent we've done is a course on the biblical prophets. Now, when this started, uh, the first course I actually did was the History of the Holocaust, which is a very uh, popular and well-attended course at UCF, always has been face-to-face. -face. But even there, our numbers started dwindling when the demand for online really peaked. Uh, so rather than just coming in and doing a straight lecture in front of the cameras, I thought, well, we've got some characters in the Holocaust that, that we could actually portray. So here's one of the first such characters I, I actually impersonated. This is a, a ghetto fighter uh, named uh, Abba Kovner. Uh, in the, the Nazi ghetto. But what are we to do in our sick souls? We bear not only the vision of the past, but also that of the future. And we feel with all our senses, the breadth of the approaching slaughtering knife, the knife which lies in ambush in every corner, on every path and highway of Europe. The new knife was born on the fields of Majdanek, Ponar, and Treblinka, where millions of the masses of tens of nations saw how it was done so easily, so simply, and so quiet. And the videographer over at CDL said, you know, we could really do a lot with, with this kind of stuff. And we did. So um, here's another example of something more recent. That, that we produced, if I can find it on screen share. <laughs> now, Milos recut the entire series that we did on the history of the Holocaust. We're accustomed to looking at the Holocaust through the lens of the victims, millions of them. But we can't really understand the terrible events that took place without considering the motives of the perpetrators. When did the final solution actually take shape? Can we pinpoint the exact moment in which Hitler's madness was transformed from wild rhetorical flourishes to serious design? 
One thing is clear, nothing was set in stone. Even well into- And that's the, the theme Nazi of the episode, that things didn't have to go the, the way they did. But, but, the but look at the well understood. quality you don't of what Milos has done, where he's terror. actually weaved in you have to have your film own people from the Holocaust era. You. These are the kind in of fact, things that we could we never do in a traditional classroom. Germans and other We've peoples were taken under the Nazis. The teaching in reality, experience, I think, to a whole consented. new level. So, so here's Martin Niemöller, we have one of no the um, of using our own powers, one of the, to escape the Protestant of the ministers who actually stood up to the Nazis, the Nazis and was persecuted Nazis. for it. No more. Are we ready? So I decided to do a little bit of acting and act out God the actual sermon that he gave in his church prior to being for arrested by the Nazis. And must remain the case that we must obey God rather than man. And then he's put in prison. And for taking collections and sentenced to seven months imprisonment. But I was released on time served. Schwarz, he sees everything black. So, so this is the kind of work that we did as a collaborative effort. Not opposing tyranny. I would record in front of a green screen with a full script and teleprompter and Milos would do the rest. Really amazing On stuff. November 5th, 19... Now I wanted to show just a few more video samples. This is from our archaeology course. Can we see this? Yes, yes, we see it. Full course on biblical archaeology, which is now one of our best attended courses in our program. We've had a wait list to get into this course. And this is the episode on King David. So every week the students get a new episode. In this case, it's a good 35 minutes long. So they're watching a TV show, Untold Stories of Biblical Archaeology, Digging Up David. And every week was a new digging up somebody. Jerusalem in the 21st century. The flashpoint. And here's my Indiana Jones today, as it is channeling Harrison Ford America, right here. So united under Israeli rule since 1967. The facts on the ground are nonetheless evidence of two Jerusalems, one Jewish, one Arab. It is. So we scrub through this and look at just how detailed it is. Here's a famous. Th this indeed had. American been scholar and archaeologist. The capital of David and Solomon, in honor of which Hebrew poets and prophets Albright. poured forth their inspired the renowned strains. William Fox where Albright. the God of Israel was. And, oh, and I love doing Sherlock. It's another medieval structure, which before Israel's 1948 War of Independence was a mosque. And before that... And my idea church. has been the time of that the hill now rather than just the trying to convey information, area, the most important thing is to raise issues. The real so I bring in Sherlock, my detective, and he will ask the questions. He will raise the academic issues. That don't have a simple answer. If he existed at all. If David existed at all. Oh yes, here's on all fours, as we saw bits of cabbage stalks floating. British archaeologists from the 19th century exploring the underground water channel in ancient Jerusalem. With a pencil, compass, and field book in my hands, and the candle for the most part in my mouth. Sir Charles Warren. 
my companion there he is. had just four inches of breathing. Again, the kind of things we could never do in a traditional classroom. But I wanted to go right to the end and share just a little bit from a modern Israeli poet who wrote about Jerusalem and what's at stake in terms of the archeology. span And I did it in Hebrew. And here's another thing we could rarely do at a classroom setting, speak the original languages with subtitles. And, and Milos actually did the subtitles. This is Yehuda Amichai. The late Yehuda Amichai summed it up. Yerushalayim ikmo ha'ir Atlantis, shetav'a bayam, hakol tavaba b'shakaba. Zo Yerushalayim shel mata, min ha-mata, u'min ha-karkaim, ma'alim k'talim harabim, b'shivre datot, k'mo kelim, me'oniyot nevu'a shetav'u. Very artful, Milos. And you actually had to figure out, and you don't speak Hebrew, but you had to figure out from the pacing where the subtitles went, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a very interesting subtitling uh, language that you don't actually speak. We've yet moved to a new project. Uh, a, a little over a year ago, I received a grant through our Arts and Humanities that was actually earmarked for video production. It's a $5,000 grant, uh, modest, but at least something. And I'd also received $2,500 through CDL for doing a course redesign, uh, including video, obviously. And that gave us a grand total of $7,500. What can you do with $7,500 in terms of creating a video documentary? Well, we went all the way to Israel, drove all across Israel, and we, on that sum, actually shot a half-hour documentary about the Israeli Druze. This is a small little sect that broke away from Islam centuries ago, and they live in northern Israel and in Galilee. And the, the majority of them are actually full citizens of Israel, and they serve in the Israeli army. And with another UCF student helping us out, uh, we shot the whole thing, came back, Milos edited it, and he has just now completed the documentary. It's a half-hour documentary that we can use in our Judaic Studies program, but we want to see how we can get it out there, even, even beyond UCF. Certainly it'll be on our website, but, but here we go. Here's the beginning of, of what Milos just now edited, completed, on the Druze. On location, beautiful scenery. Milo shot it all. They are not Jews and they are not Muslim. They are known as the Druze. They are an ethnic and religious minority at the very heart of the multiple dilemmas faced by the modern state of Israel as it struggles to be a Jewish nation while at the same time democratic and diverse. Now, we had to do this, obviously, on a shoestring, but it looks absolutely gorgeous. I had tried to contact some prominent members of the Druze community from the United States without any luck at all. So we went to Israel and just gave it a shot to, to see who we could find. Uh, what do you call this, Milos? We call, it, we call ourselves guerrilla. <laughs> It was definitely guerrilla filmmaking. 
<laughs> yeah, guerrilla filmmaking. We, we didn't know exactly what we were doing, even, <laughs> but we got to the country, rented a car, just started driving. We knew where the Druze village was. This is the mayor of uh, the Druze village. Actually, it started at a little restaurant in the village, Daliat el Carmel. We went to a restaurant, and in Israel, everybody seems to know everybody. And the restaurant tour just happened to know. Here's the restaurant tour. I'm a Druze man. I live in Dalit El Carmel, uh, the biggest uh, village, Druze village in Israel. Uh, I am the owner of uh, this restaurant named Hummus Najwa. You are invited. You are invited, yes. A little commercial there. But the restaurant tour just happened to know the mayor of the town. Introduced us. Here's the mayor. So now we got an interview with the mayor of the Druze village. And the mayor also knew a prominent Israeli general, a general in the Israel Defense Force named Amal Assad, who has actually been very much in the Israeli news in the last year, having to do with a certain political issue and a law that was passed in Israel that the Druze did not like. And the chance that I could find this general, I thought were, were not very high when we went to the country, but sure enough, the mayor introduced us. I'm an art researcher. So here's our director's cut of the, of the video, of the documentary. In the last three years, and Milos, what can you add to all this process of, of editing? Yes, well, I mean, you, you already kind of covered most of it. Uh, you know, it was a shoestring budget. It was very, um, it was working with very limited resources. But um, I think that that also, like working in this way, um, gives um, gives a little bit of um, some, some kind of like a raw quality to um, to to what you're filming to to the entire documentary. Um, I, I think it works really nice um, if, it, if the process is simplified, um, could be used, uh, you know, as a, I really, I really believe it could be used as an, as an educational tool, you know, that it, 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 it brings something, if you, if you bring the camera um, and then kind of like use it to, to approach this, this culture, um, it really brings out something very interesting, and I think we were able to um, to use it in a very nice way and and um, and make something that's that's um, uh, very watchable, 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 instructional, educational. Here's my barber, Monir, who's Druze, and yet he wears a star of David around his neck because he's a proud Israeli citizen. So we went all over, actually several Druze villages, and here's a museum, the Druze Museum, in another little town in Galilee. Also from secular tourists, only religious people are allowed to read in the holy books. As for the sacred texts of the Druze, the Druze Culture Museum. And here is General Amal Assad, As a, commander, a major and, uh, figure in today's uh, Israel. Uh, Brigadier General uh, at 1999. He also became head of the Civil Administration Unit of the IDF in charge of civilian relations with the Palestinian Authority. I spent three, three years in that job, and uh, we did a very good job. I mean, the army. And I even didn't get only uh, even one stone in, in, in my car when I was uh, uh, there because the people wanted to have their respect, uh, their honor. And uh, this is what we did. We fought for, with the uh, terrorists, but we gave the people, the rest of the people, their honors. So it's really a pleasure to see what we were able to do on a shoestring budget and 
hopefully we can be an inspiration to others who want to follow in our footsteps. This is the actual border. You're looking into Syria. Israel is in the foreground. Syria is the background. There's the border fence. So we're very much talking about contemporary situations, cultural and, yes, political. Here's the Israeli Knesset, the parliament. Of course, laws are enacted. It's important to point out that Israel is extremely proud of the relations it has cultivated with its minorities and especially the Druze. This it is this slow, uh, especially so Milos. <laughs> Anything else to add about the documentary? Um, well, I hope people like it. <laughs> hope people like it. Well, that's a very good aspiration. Uh, we would like to produce additional documentary videos and we can go, we prove that we can actually go internationally, that we can shoot on site, we can edit well, make a product that, that really looks professional, that's very viewable. And we are, of course, trailblazing. One final thing that I've done recently is to produce some sit-down interviews with our two local rabbis in the Jewish community who serve UCF students. Uh, Rabbi uh, Abisror, Yisrael Abisror of UCF Hillel. And uh, here we have just a little intro into that sit-down interview edited by CDL. And they've done a very nice job in, in creating an intro we're calling it the, the, the Jewish Wisdom Series. So I have a whole number of these sit-down interviews planned for the future going forward. The University of Central Florida Judaic Studies Program. And I'm very pleased to be here today with my friend and associate who also teaches for our program, Rabbi Israel Abisror, who is the Yehudi rabbi at UCF Hillel. Hillel being the Jewish student organization here on campus. And we're gonna to talk today about basic aspects of Jewish life here in the United States. But first, I wanna to get to what your position is, what you do here at the University of Central Florida, a little bit about your own background and how you relate and interact with UCF students. Amazing, thank you so much, Dr. Einstein. So my name is uh, Rabbi Yisrael Ambassador. I'm the Yehudi Rabbi at Hillel, as well as the director of Yehudi Orlando. I'm also an adjunct professor for the Judaic Studies Pro, a truly uh, Jewish and equally college experience while they're here at the University of Central Florida. And one more, here's the second episode that we recorded just prior to the pandemic <laughs> with Rabbi Chaim Lipsker of UCF Chabad. So we have two Jewish organizations at UCF. We have Hillel and Chabad, and here's our other rabbi who also I'm teaches for us. Dr. Hansen, coordinator of the University of Central Florida Judaic Studies Program. And I'm here today with my good friend and colleague, Rabbi Chaim Lipsker of UCF Chabad. And we're going to talk today about this really incredible organization, Chabad Lubavitch, which happens to be the largest organization of Hasidic Jews in the world today. We're going to talk about what Chabad is, how it began. We're going to talk about the role of Chabad as representative of Orthodox Jews in the American Jewish community and in the world. And we're going to go all the way back to the very beginnings of this movement in the 1700s uh, that has representatives all over the world. Um, and Rabbi Lipsker is also teaching in our program. That. Chabad so Rebbe these kind of videos, about 30 minutes long, are also um, quite usable in America, our Judaic Studies uh, courses and beyond work. that in and, uh, the YouTube channel. He made it and who knows to, where uh, else, uh, but uh, uh, bring Judaism to uh, again, this is something we can do for our students and for the community at large in creating dynamic video presentations that have, have really not been utilized to the full uh, in a university environment. And we're, we're hoping that we're going to remain on the cutting edge, thanks to editors like Milos. 
So thank you again very much, Milos, for all the work that you have done. Thanks to UCF College of Arts and Humanities. And as we say in Hebrew, Kadima onward. Hi, everybody. If anybody has any questions for Ken, you can use the chat function here in, in Zoom. If you don't see it at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little icon or a word at the bottom that says more with three dots. Click on that and it'll open up your chat screen. Right now I have one question so far and a couple of comments. Um, one of the questions, the very first one that came in was to ask Ken whether he had any difficulties with copyright issues on the images that he's used in his videos or did he use Creative Commons images or images from a similar site? very tricky and, and difficult issue, in fact. Um, that's actually the reason that we recut the entire Holocaust series. The first time that we created it was just with random images, but then I asked Milos to go back and do the whole thing over again from Creative Commons. So yeah, we, we have indeed addressed that. Um, but then there's also the question of what is fair use? Uh, we're, we're not charging anybody for these images. We're not making any money off of them. Um, so that's another issue. And I've talked to several representatives, in, including legal representatives from UCF. And it's, it's really a muddy kind of issue, to be honest. Um, when I did the archaeology course as, as a video series, I deliberately searched for images that, that seemed to be free and open. But um, it, again, it, it's fuzzy. I haven't had any complaints from, from any source whatsoever. Um, the bottom line is if I get any complaints for anybody who, who doesn't like my use of their image uh, or one slipped by, whatever, then I would be obliged to take it down or take the video down or recut it, but one step at a time. Okay, we have another question that just came in. And what that one is, is from, from Bruce, and it is, have you done user student studies? Hang on there a second. I just had a notification over the top of my screen. To get a sense as to whether or how, and how much the video approach enhances learning. We actually did a research project on this, in fact, and published the, the results. And I, I did an academic presentation at a conference on this entire question, uh, surveying questions, uh, sur surveying students rather, and asking them specific questions about their integration of the, of the video material into their own learning process, how much it helped, uh, how many times they watched them, did they take notes, on and on. Uh, and I worked hand in glove with, um, with Chuck Jubin's office to frame these questions and collect the responses and to, to present serious research. And the bottom line is that the feedback has been really stellar and a lot of student response saying, yes, yes, we love this, we have used this, this is extremely helpful to our, our learning process. What actions do you suggest people take? I mean, one of the ones that I can think of right off is register for some of these courses that you offer for credit and, and watch the videos and learn more of the valuable information. And you, can, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel. I have over 2,000 subscribers now, and I decided from the beginning that I want to make this public. Why not? Uh, it, ha it has not reduced our enrollments. Of course, students want to take the course. They want credit for the course. But this has really um, enlarged our profile for the general community. And of course, worldwide, people can subscribe to my channel, and they do. Uh, so, so this is something that uh, I would encourage anybody who we've got, what, six courses now? Just, uh, you know, jump into YouTube. All you have to do is go to YouTube, type in my name, and it'll take you right to the, the channel and subscribe and maybe give a thumbs up, you know, like you do on, on YouTube. But beyond that, there's so much creative work that can be done now with, with YouTube, even just for an online course, if you happen to teach, just plug in your laptop and, go, you know, start a video for, for your students. And it, yes, YouTube, there are so many YouTubers out there now. It's a real phenomenon. And people can create their own video, whether it's professionally edited or not, uh, just to share ideas, thoughts, intellectual ideas. Why not? I mean, it's a, it's a whole new world 
and we're discovering this more and more now that the pandemic has forced us into it. I say, let's take advantage of it. I have another question. And that is, do you find that students need support with understanding the geography, cities, and topography? Include maps whenever relevant. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's part of it. I make sure that we do. Um, and geography is a real issue, especially nowadays. Uh, when um, I don't know if I should mention, but I understand there was a survey done of young university students that indicated that, in fact, the majority could not identify the difference between Israel and Spain on a map. So we, we have to take into consideration where our students are coming from and make adjustments. So that, that's why I'm, I'm yeah, we, we have to integrate maps wherever possible. Well, thank you for the presentation.